Okay. <clears throat> so welcome everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar that we organize as the Department of Biology of the University of Padua. Let me introduce myself. I am Luigi Bubaco. I am the chairman of the department. And I'm very pleased today to, to introduce the, the speaker, David Pamen, and also Professor Talmo Pievani, that is the faculty of our department. I give you a few words of introduction of this event, and, and then eventually Talmo will, will introduce the speaker. So the idea here, the idea of this webinar was to give everybody an opportunity to spend an hour or our time to, to go behind the, uh, the, behind the emergency, behind the, 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 the pandemic and have the time to settle a little bit of the concept, the time to go further than, than the bulletin we get every day with the people that are infected, the people that are the passed away and, and having the time to try to have some knowledge, some understanding of the situation. And this is the type of thing that we, we, we want to do. And we think that as university, as a scientist, we have the obligation to give more information, to give element to people that are in a very stressful situation to, to understand what happened and what is happening and what we have in front of us. And so to do that, we have to look backward, we have to look forward. And, and, and but most of, important of all, we need to, to get somebody like, like Dr. Kwemen that is a knowledgeable scholar that spend, spend a lot of his time studying this event that as you know very well by now was able to, to get hint, very strong hint, scientific data to predict this kind of event. So the idea here is, and I stop with this comment, is that we have now the opportunity to learn a bit more and also to have the time to settle a concept of this, to try to rationalize what happened and what is happening. And I finish with a, with a comment. And my idea is that, and I hope that David will help us to reinforce that concept, is that the only way out of this situation, of this emotional thunderstorm is science and is the time it takes to understand things. We have to invest time in getting information. And we hope that with this webinar, we can give our contribution. And with this said, I give the word to Professor Telmo Piavani for the introduction of the speaker that I thank for taking the time to share his knowledge with us. Thank you, Luigi. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce my, my, my friend, my colleague, David Coleman. Uh, of course, David Coleman doesn't need any, any, any presentation. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, after literary studies, uh, David became one of the, of the most important science writers uh, worldwide, uh, contributing to National Geographic, The New Yorker, uh, The New York Times, review of books and, and so on. And became recently very famous due to the fact that he is the author of Spillover, published in 2012, where he, uh, you know, where he predicted uh, zoonosis quite exactly like COVID-19. But I'd like to remember that David is also author of other very acclaimed and, 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 and appreciated books um, naturalistic books such as the the flight of the flight of the iguana, uh, the song of the dodo about the about the island biogeography, uh, the boilerplate rhino and monster of God about the man eating predators, and also I remember for you and I suggest for you uh, to to read the reluctant Mister Darwin that is a wonderful delicious book about about Darwin delay very long delay in publishing The Origin of Species, so a book about history of science and history of Darwinian thought. And then again, uh, The Chimp and the River about HIV uh, uh, evolution, HIV emergence in, in, in Africa. And the latest, After Spillover, that I, I, I strongly suggest for you, for biologists, but not only, uh, The Tangled Tree. Uh, so the, the intricate tree of life. That is a fascinating story of the discoveries um, about lateral gene transfer, about endosymbiosis and, 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 and horizontal connections between the branches of, of the tree of the Darwinian tree of life with beautiful pictures and portraits of biologists 
not so recognized in the field like uh, Carl Booth, Lynn Margulis, and, 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 and many others. So now David is writing the sequel of Spillover, and and I stop here. So because, because we are looking forward to hearing you, David. And so please now the the virtual floor is for you. And thank you again for accepting our invitation. Now we will have uh, an initial presentation by David, and then we will have time to uh, question and answers. And please, I ask people uh, attending to uh, to to write to put the question in the section uh, question and answer, not in the chat, but in the question and answer section. And then I will select and, and I, I'll give the floor to uh, the people, to our colleagues for, for question directly to David. So David, it's, it's, it's for you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Telmo. Uh, and thank you, Professor Babaco. Um, thank you all for inviting me to talk with you and, and, um, it's always a pleasure to talk with my friends in Italy, and I just wish I were there in person and able to do it in person. That time will come again. Um, this will be really a, 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 not a scientific lecture, not a formal lecture, a very quiet conversation with you all. Uh, I'll talk for 25 or 30 minutes, and then we'll have questions back and forth, as Telmo said. My purpose is to help, help you and help all of us understand better this event uh, by way of science, as Luigi said, uh, by way of evolutionary biology, uh, the evolution of this pandemic. And in order to understand it better, what is going on, uh, it's, it's useful to think about the virus itself, the virus that is causing this horrible event, and four questions about this virus that are quite important and lead us to a better understanding. And all four of those questions can be addressed by thinking about evolution. So the four questions that I wanna talk about are first of all, where did it come from, this virus? Secondly, what does it want? Viruses don't actually have wills, but in a metaphorical sense, what does it want from us? Third, will we ever be rid of it, this virus? And fourth, will there be more viruses like this coming and therefore more pandemics coming in the future? That's what I wanna talk about. So first of all, first question, where did it come from, this virus? Well, we know that everything comes from somewhere and dangerous new viruses that get into humans and cause new diseases come from wild animals. We know that. How do we know that? Why do we know that? We know that because viruses can only replicate in cellular creatures. They can only make copies of themselves. They can only function inside the cells of cellular creatures. Viruses are not cells. Viruses are just little packets, protein wrapped packets, little capsules inside which uh, are genomes. A genome can be either a genome of DNA, the famous double helix molecule, or it can be a, de a gen genome of another um, genetic molecule, RNA, which is, which is generally a single strand of the letters of the genetic alphabet, as opposed to the double strand of, of DNA. So, um, so viruses are just these little capsules uh, containing genomes, and they replicate themselves by attaching to cells of cellular creatures and then inserting their genome into the cell where the genome hijacks the machinery of the cell to make copies of itself. Now, cellular creatures, what is that? Well, all animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, other creatures, creatures other than viruses are all cellular creatures. Some of them are simple cells like bacteria. Some of them are composed of many complex cells performing different functions like animals and plants. We are of course animals and we are composed of cells like that. The viruses that, that can get into humans and replicate uh, generally in humans generally come 
from animals. Almost certainly all of them come from, from animals because we are animals and the viruses in plants or fungi are less likely to be able to infect us. So when there is a new virus in humans, we know it has come somehow from a wild animal. We live in a world of viruses. There are viruses everywhere. There are multiple viruses in every species of wild animal and domestic animal on the planet and every species of plant and every species of fungus. There are viruses. Some of those viruses over the course of evolutionary history have performed important functions. Viruses move, move genetic material around and sometimes they bring genetic material into a species that is actually beneficial to that species. But what we think of when it comes to viruses is disease. Viruses cause disease. They cause disease simply because when they get in us and they replicate, um, in some cases that has consequences for the body in which they are replicating. Um, now, how does this happen? How do viruses pass from non-human animals into humans? Well, viruses are, are essentially passive. They don't seek us out. Uh, viruses uh, can't walk, they can't run, they can't swim, they can't fly. They ride. They ride inside of creatures. But if, if the creature the host in which a virus is existing, is riding, is disturbed, is disrupted, then the virus can have an opportunity to pass from its customary host, maybe a monkey, maybe a rodent, maybe a bat, into a different kind of host, maybe a human. That happens not because they're seeking us out, but because of opportunity. How does that opportunity happen? It happens because we humans are constantly coming, coming in contact with wild animals and giving viruses carried by those animals the opportunity to pass into us. How do we do that? We do that by capturing or killing wild animals for food, but not just that. We do it by disrupting rich, diverse ecosystems in which many different animals carrying many different viruses live. We go into these places, we cut the trees, we build timber camps, we build mining camps, we pull minerals out of the ground. Uh, and in doing that, we give viruses the opportunity to pass from their non-human animal host into the first human victim. And then if it happens that they can replicate in a human victim, uh, then there's a chance that they can transmit from one human to another. We think of viruses causing disease, but disease really is just a way that viruses manage to get themselves transmitted from one human to another. If it, a virus infects the cells in your, in your respiratory tract, in your windpipe, and builds up there and causes irritation, causes a sore throat, causes maybe pneumonia, a person starts to cough, the virus is expelled on the cough and has a chance of getting into another person. So that's just, that's just a technique, a strategy that a virus uses to get itself transmitted from one human to another. My second question, what does it want? What is this virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, the virus that scientists call SARS-CoV-2, what does it want? What does it want from us humans? Again, uh, I, as I said, the idea that it wants is a metaphor. I don't want to anthropomorphize the virus except insofar as it helps us understand. Viruses don't really have desires, uh, but because they are creatures that replicate using a genome, a genome of DNA or a genome of RNA, because they replicate themselves by way of a genome, they are subject to what I call the, the Darwinian imperatives, the three Darwinian imperatives, and of course, named for Charles Darwin. And um, I believe you can all see that figure in red, the tree-like figure. That's Charles Darwin's drawing, very earliest drawing of the idea of the evolution of diversity, complexity, uh, and adaptation through the process that he had discovered, the process of natural selection. That's 
a, a drawing from his one of his earliest notebooks, Darwin's Tree of Life, with the D and the B there representing different species that have evol evolved. Um, so what are the Darwinian imperatives? Very simple, three things. First of all, make as many copies of yourself as you can. Lay as many eggs as possible, have as many progeny, have as many children as possible so that um, you, 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 um, you fill the world with copies of yourself. Secondly, um, expand yourself in geographical space. This is the part about filling the world. Spread out those many, many copies that, that you're making of yourself. You want them to spread out to different individual hosts in geographical space. Go forth, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the world. The third Darwinian imperative is extend yourself in time. Survive, the survival of the fittest. Survive, persist, avoid going extinct. And if you if you adhere to the first two Darwinian imperatives, make as many copies of yourself as possible and expand yourself in geographical space, then the likelihood is that you will achieve the third Darwinian imperative. You will extend yourself in time. You will avoid extinction. You will survive. Um, so my third um, question, will we ever be rid of it, this virus? Uh, the chances are that we will not. The chances are that this virus is now in us forever. It may evolve to become less harmful in humans. It may evolve um, uh, to become no more than a common cold, like some of the other coronaviruses that have infected us, but we don't know that for sure. The measles virus has been in us for thousands of years. And although we've had a vaccine against measles for 60 years, there are thousands of people around the world who haven't been vaccinated who still get measles each year. And in fact, in a bad year, there are thousands, even tens of thousands of people who die of measles. So we don't know what the future of COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like in us. Um, it could, it could be with us forever becoming just an annoyance, or it could be with us forever remaining a danger to some people so that it is necessary for us even 40 years from now to be vaccinated against this virus and other coronaviruses. Uh, before I talk about the question of will there be more of these coming, I wanna say a little bit more about um, about the first question, where did this virus come from? We've heard, oh, it came maybe from a, a, a seafood market in the city of Wuhan. Uh, maybe it came from a bat. Was that bat brought to that seafood market? These are the early stories that came out about the possible origins of this virus. Let me explain how those stories have changed and become more complicated as we have learned more about this virus. First of all, as soon as this virus was, um, was isolated from human victims in the city of Wuhan back in December of 2019, and scientists then sequenced the genome of this virus, they could see that it was a coronavirus. It belongs to the family of coronaviruses. That immediately rang bells for scientists alarm bells, knowing that this is a coronavirus. Why? Because there is a history of coronaviruses infecting humans. Uh, I don't know if you can hear the howling in the background right now. That's my wife and our two wolfhounds who are, are doing their morning howl. Um, a little bit of, of music in the background. Uh, back in 2003, the SARS outbreak, the first SARS, a virus emerged in Southern China. It spread through the city of Hong Kong from the international airport. It got to Toronto, Beijing, Hanoi, uh, Bangkok, um, and it made people very sick. It killed one in every 10 of the people that it infected. Fortunately, it was stopped 
It only infected 8,000 people and killed about 800. That was the first SARS. That was the first really dangerous coronavirus that got into humans. When that happened, alert scientists started studying coronaviruses, looking for where this particular virus had come from. Um, scientists in, in China and with international colleagues went looking for the host. What animal did this virus, the first SARS virus come from? And they found viruses very similar to it in bats, in horseshoe bats. So they concluded that almost certainly this virus had come from bats by way of an intermediate animal known as the masked palm civet, the civet, a large animal, a wild animal that is raised for food in China and sold in markets and restaurants. And the bat virus evidently passed through uh, a, a civet and from the civet, it got into humans, possibly some people working in markets or restaurants, and then got into people. So that's the history of, of SARS, the original SARS 2003. It was traced through civets back to bats. Then there was a team of scientists led by a, a woman named Dr. Zhengli Shi, who has a laboratory at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, by coincidence, right there in the city of Wuhan. And she began studying the viruses, particularly the coronaviruses that live in bats in China. She and her team would go to caves, they would capture bats, they would sample them, they would take uh, uh, they would take feces, they would take saliva, they would take bodily fluids from these bats, and they would take those samples back to the lab laboratory and look for the genetic material of viruses. They weren't generally growing viruses, they were lo just looking for the RNA uh, signatures of these viruses. And they found a number of coronaviruses living in bats in caves in southern China, and they started publishing about this. Uh, they found a virus in 2013. They gave it a number, a code number. In, in 2016, they published a warning about the, the, the diversity of bats, uh, the diversity of coronaviruses in bats in southern China. 2017, they published another warning about all of the coronaviruses they were finding in bats. 2019, they published another warning about the coronaviruses that they were finding in bats. There were all these warnings coming from her team, Dr. Zheng Li Shi and others about the danger of coronaviruses in bats that could be transmissible to humans, could cause infection in humans. And then 2000, late 2019, this virus appears in people in Wuhan, starts making them sick, the genome is sequenced and it is another coronavirus. And then in early 2020, um, Dr. Zheng Li Shi published another paper with her team and she said, aha, we have some evidence of where this virus came from. We have a virus that we found in a mine shaft in 2013 in Southern China that is 96% similar to this new COVID-19 virus, 96% similar. And that is very strong evidence that this virus, the SARS-2 virus, also came from a bat, ultimately from a bat probably in Southern China. Now, was it the same virus? Had she found in 2013 the same virus that would become our COVID-19 virus? No, as I said, 96% similar, but 96% similar for coronaviruses represents 40 or 50 years of independent evolution. So what that suggested was that the virus that she found had been living probably for thousands of years in a bat population in Southern China. And there was another bat population that was separate and there were coronaviruses living in that too. And um, the separation between these two bat populations had occurred perhaps 40 or 50 years ago, maybe by destruction of habitat, maybe by human activities that prevented those bats from circulating 
from one group to another and mating and passing their viruses back and forth. So those two bat populations had been separated for 40 or 50 years and the coronaviruses in them evolved separately for 40 or 50 years. So here was the population of bats in which uh, Zheng Li Shi had found her sample. Here is the population of bats separate for 40 or 50 years in which another coronavirus was evolving. We don't know where that population of bats is, but in that population of bats, presumably is the immediate progenitor of this virus of SARS-CoV-2. Um, that's what we th think we know at this point. Did the virus spill over from a bat to a human in that seafood market uh, in the city of Wuhan, the, the, it's called the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market? Probably not. Probably it was already circulating in humans. We have evidence that it was circulating in humans in Wuhan as early as December 1st of 2019. And the case that, it, that occurred was recognized on December 1st, had no known contact with that particular market. It was later that probably another kind of animal brought to that market for food or possibly a human who was already infected carried that virus into that market and spread it to other people in the market creating the cluster. But the actual spillover, the passage of the virus from its non-human animal host into its first human victim may have occurred in the province of Yunnan. Um, it may have been a bat to a human because a person was shoveling guano out of a cave to, to fertilize his or her garden and got infected, or it may have been someone handling a bat, or it may have been that the bat passed it to another animal, such as a pangolin, a beautiful little ant-eating sort of creature that looks like an armadillo, and from that to humans, we don't know but it passed from its non-human host into its human sometime before December of 2019, started to circulate. It may have circulated slowly and then evolved to improve its ability to multiply itself in humans and to transmit from human to human and became a more effective human pathogen. We don't know. We just know with high degree of confidence that it came from a wild animal, a bat, it had evolved naturally, it got into humans, then it got to the city of Wuhan, and from the city of Wuhan, it got to the world. Uh, now, my fourth question, uh, will there be more of these coming? Yes, unfortunately, there will be. Not necessarily more pandemics, but there will be more spillovers coming of viruses passing from wild animals into human hosts, in some cases causing an outbreak of disease, maybe a dozen people, two, three dozen people in, in a small town in the Southwestern United States or in a remote village in Africa or in, uh, in a provincial city in Southern China. Yes, there will probably almost certainly be more spillovers and those spillovers will probably cause outbreaks. But it's not inevitable that every outbreak should turn into an epidemic sweeping across a country and then a pandemic sweeping around the world. That is not inevitable. That is something that we can control. We can do our best to control anyway, if we are better prepared the next time. We need to recognize that these spillovers causing new diseases have been happening and happening with increasing frequency over the last 60 years. In my book, Spillover, I recount some of this history. It goes back at least to the case of Machupo virus spilling over from rodents into humans in 1961 in Bolivia, causing Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. 1967, Marburg virus appeared in Marburg, Germany, carried by monkeys that had been shipped up for medical research from Uganda, and a new virus that was a cousin to what we eventually recognized as Ebola virus spilled over, a very dangerous virus, from monkeys into humans, 1967. 1976, the first recognition of an Ebola outbreak. 
Again, a terribly dangerous virus kills 60% or so of the people that it infects. Comes from a wild animal. We still don't know for sure which wild animal Ebola comes from, although we suspect it's bats. And this sequence goes on. Um, HIV, the virus causing AIDS, was recognized in 1981. The story behind that is much more complicated. I tell that story in my book, The Chimp and the River. Um, um, 1994, uh, a virus called Hendra spilling out of bats in Australia, getting into racehorses and passing from racehorses into humans. 1998, Nipah virus in Malaysia, again, passing from bats into pigs and then from pigs into humans, causing a, a deadly disease. 1997, bird flu in Hong Kong, coming out of wild birds, getting into chickens and ducks, getting into people causing death. 2003, I've already talked about the original SARS in China coming out of bats uh, into humans. 2012, another coronavirus causing MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in the Saudi Arabian area, coming out of bats through camels into humans. Zika virus in 2015, boom, 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 a drumbeat of these events viruses coming from wild animals, getting into humans, in some cases causing just a few dozen deaths, in some cases, such as this case, causing millions of deaths. This is, this is what spillover is about. Viruses tumbling from wild animals into humans and causing these disease threats. Why? And why more now? Because there are more humans now than ever, and we're causing more disruption of wild, diverse ecosystems than ever. There are 8 billion of us on the planet. We're hungry. We're smart. We're pulling resources from the natural world toward ourselves. And all of the choices that we make, what we eat, what we wear, what we buy generally, uh, how much we travel, how much fossil fuel we use, how many children we have, if we have children, all of those decisions that are made by all of us add up to our collective footprint on the natural world. And that footprint is what dislodges these viruses, these naturally occurring viruses in wild animals, dislodges them from their wild animals and gives them the opportunity to become human infections, to become human pandemics. So that's... Um, with, uh, with thanks to Charles Darwin, that's the way I see uh, this pandemic and the way it has evolved. And I'll end simply by reaffirming the fact that we can do something about this. We are smart as well as hungry and, um, and numerous, we humans. We can create vaccines, which we have done already, and prevent uh, this virus from, from spreading uh, any more drastically than it already has. We can also prevent future spillovers from becoming pandemics by recognizing ways to reduce, to mitigate our impact on the natural world in terms of our consumption, in terms of our arrangement, also in terms of our preparedness against pandemics, our readiness with, with prototype platform vac vaccines that can be adopt adapted to a new kind of virus with international networks of surveillance and viral discovery, we can be prepared better next time. It involves individual responsibility and involves the way we function as communities, the way we look after our fellow community members, as well as ourselves and our own families. And it also involves the national leaders that we choose. We have to vote intelligently. We have to vote for leaders who believe in science and who don't deny science. Uh, we can do all of that. And, uh, and I think we will. So uh, I'll stop there. And uh, Telmo, I hope we have some provocative, difficult questions. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Great, great, very clear picture. And, and uh, also with the final prediction about future pandemics, we have to believe in it because you usually you are right in your predictions. So absolutely. And also 
this great invitation to have uh, to vote for politicians uh, uh, sensible to science. In Italy, we have the problem. We, we, we should have some of them to, to, to select among them, but we, we don't see them uh, so far. Anyway, we have questions. Um, you have explained in a, in a wonderful way that we are in the, in the middle of, of something like an evolutionary process, right? Even, even the vaccines, variants of the virus is, is a red queen uh, dynamics, classical standard dynamic. But, but we are disrupting ecosystems, so we are increasing the likelihood of, of, of pandemic outbreaks. And the first question is coming from a student. So I, I invite the, the technicians to give the floor to Gilberto Vergani that had that, uh, and, and Gilberto has a couple of questions related to, to this set. So Gilberto, please, the floor is for you. Can you, can you hear? And can you, you, yes. you, see, you, uh, can speak. you hear me? Please, yes. All right. Um, in your book, you underline more than once that spillovers are occurring more and more frequently um, due to humans uh, disturbing the delicate equilibrium of nature. Uh, think of deforestation, mining, industrialization, etc. cetera. Uh, under a certain point of view, uh, we could certainly um, do more to minimize our impact on, the, on these ecosystems. But uh, on the other hand, I think it's inevitable that our impact on nature is going only to increase uh, because we are 7 billion people currently on Earth, and the, the number is, going, is only going to raise, apparently. So uh, even if we try to reduce the deforestation, the mining, uh, and the intensive, the intensive breeding, etc., cetera, um, we are still going to need more and more resources. So I uh, wanted to, to ask you, uh, what are your thoughts on this matter? And if there is something we can uh, um, practically do to reduce our impact on the on the ecosystems. Yeah, thank you, Gilberto. Um, you're absolutely right that um, our impact is going to continue for a long time, and it's going to continue increasing because, as you said, um, our, we can't stop popu human population growth right now. Suddenly, uh, there's nothing that can be done, probably, to prevent human population. Uh, from reaching, you say 7 billion, I, I usually say 8 billion. Anyway, it's between 7 and 8. It's almost 8 billion, I think, at this point. Um, and um, the projections are that uh, even with extreme efforts um, by countries and individuals to reduce population growth, the human population is likely to peak at between 9 billion and 11 billion people which is just unthinkable. I mean, even 8 billion, that's four times as many people as there were 100 years ago at the time of the 1918 influenza, four times as many. So we've slowed down the rate of growth. We can continue to slow down the rate of growth, but, the, but growth will continue. We have to, I believe, um, I believe we have to do a number of things simply to put the brakes on how much um, disruption we cause of the natural world. Our impact on the natural world is, of course, not just a matter of population size, but it's a matter of population multiplied by consumption, individual consumption and collective consumption. So how can we cut down the impact of our consumption even as our, um, our population continues, I hope, at a slower and slower rate to rise and eventually stops and will decline. Uh, we can do that um, with, um, with individual responsibility and with improved technology. Um, technology is part of this equation. Um, actually, uh, the impact is really uh, population size multiplied by consumption and then factored with technology. And technology can either exacerbate the impact that we have. For instance, a chainsaw, the invention of a chainsaw, that's technology that exacerbates the impact of humans. Um, but um, the invention of machines that can recycle plastics and turn them into fabric that can tur be turned into jackets, um, that's a form of technology that tends to decrease our consumption. So, so Technology can be either a positive or a negative factor multiplied into this equation. Um, we need to make it 
a positive factor in as many cases as possible. We need to use science and technology to find ways to decrease the impact um, of our, our needs um, on the natural world. Um, solar technology, another example. Wind power technology. These are technologies that can decrease the amount of resources that we use and therefore decrease our impact on those forests teeming with viruses. Um, education and, and, and the technologies of education can Im improve the ways that we teach science to young people. It's extraordinarily important that we teach science to young people. And by young people, I mean, um, children in the fourth or the fifth grade. Um, um, they, I believe strongly, they should be learning not just about the facts of science. Well, there are this many planets and, and the planets um, orbit around the sun. It should be more than that. They should be beginning to learn that science is a method of knowing. Science is a process of discovery and fourth or fifth grade is not too soon to start telling children the great stories of scientific discovery. Science is a human process um, that involves using observation and experiment and uh, forming hypotheses and then confirming or, or falsifying hypotheses leading toward better understanding. I think all of this is crucial that we begin that um, when when kids are young and help them to understand uh, that science is, is not a body of facts. It's a process for understanding their world and understanding the finiteness, the limits of their world and the limits of the natural world um, uh, that we share on this planet with so many species. So um, it's, it's, I suppose, a long answer, but it's a long answer to a complicated and important question. And I hope some of it is is uh, makes sense to you, Gilberto. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, David. Now we have a question from um, our colleague Francesco Argenton. Please, Francesco. Again, about ecology and, and, and species. Francesco, are you connected? Francesco, unmute yeah, yourself. Yeah, I am. I am. Let me also start the video because I was in the background. Okay. okay, so my question is whether you recognize the importance of the immune system in the, uh, in the individuals of the animals whose uh, um, um, ecosystem is endangered. And uh, I, I mean, uh, when you, when you dis destroy an ecosystem, these animals will be sick uh, somehow. And this sickness can also boost the, um, the viral uh, growth in there and the, in these individuals. So yeah. it, isn't it important, isn't it important to uh, recognize the, the health of the animal also in farms, I would say. So the, yeah. the, the animals with growth must be uh, really in health. Otherwise this is going to be, um, I would say, uh, um, um, a pabulum, let's say, for this, for the growth of these microorganisms, let's say. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's important. Yes, um, uh, scientists have have shown in a number of cases that the health of a host animal um, is one of the factors that um, affects how much virus it sheds. Virus being transmitted, we talk about that as viral shedding. Um, mm much virus builds up in a particular individual and, and then passes out to the world, passes into the air or passes out through bodily fluids, how much virus is shed. And animals that are under stress and whose immune systems are compromised for some reason are likely to shed more viruses and, and therefore be a greater risk of spilling over into humans. And that includes, as you say, that includes domestic animals as well as wild animals. If we have a if we have 10,000 chickens in a flock and they are stressed, then they are being factory farmed. And, um, and a, a wild bird brings in a new influenza virus <clears throat> and it passes through that flock of chickens. Um, those, those chickens, if they are stressed by crowded conditions, um, by, um, 
by other factors that are simply intended to cause them to put on fat more quickly in order to be harvested, um, there is a greater danger that those those animals, those chickens will be shedding more virus and therefore presenting more of an influenza danger to humans. And as I'm sure you know, Francesco, there is a, there is a, a field of thought, you could even call it a global movement devoted to considering just the, um, the concerns that you raised and it's called the One Health Movement. Mm -hmm. One Health. Animal health, human health, ecosystem health, it's all one. Wild animals, domestic animals, the human animal, and the ecosystems in which we all live, it's all a single concern. And, um, and we, the individual members of that constellation cannot be healthy independently. They are more likely to be healthy if the whole constellation of, of animals, ecosystems, humans, the health of plants, um, if, uh, if the one health is, is taken into consideration and made uh, a high priority. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a question from Libero Vitiello. Please, Libero, floor is for you. You can speak. Couple of seconds. There's Libero. Yeah, okay, sorry. Zoom just quit on me for a second. Sorry, can you see me now? Yes, please. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a question that goes, uh, it's more like a, goes back to the pandemic more directly. And I was wondering if you could comment on some of the, I would call them disturbing aspects of the possible discussion of the possible origin of the virus. Just a couple of days ago, I was on CNN and I heard again, somebody who was not, Joe Blow on the street though, unfortunately, it was a, somebody from CDC. I couldn't, I didn't quite catch if it was a former member or a present member, but I'm pretty sure it was from CDC. And the guy was a virologist and said, you know, in my opinion, I'm entitled to my opinion. There are, there's still a possibility that, that the virus would have, could have originated from a human error from the Wuhan coronavirus research lab, et cetera. And this is, of course, something that we have been hearing all along the pandemic. But I was wondering, and I haven't actually looked into this, and I was, I was asking you, is there any shred of evidence that could even remotely suggest such a, that, I mean, human errors happen. I mean, that, okay, we, we all know in the lab, I mean, that it, it happens, but is there re any real data that could induce somebody who's supposed to be a, a CDC member, for crying out loud, to go out and, and and with such a bombshell to, to the public? Yeah, um, thank you, Libero. That's, a, that's an important question to address. Um, the, the fellow that you saw was not just a member of the CDC, he was the former director of the CDC. His name is Robert Redfield. And he was on CNN two nights or three nights ago. Uh, and he said exactly what you say, which is that in his opinion- yeah, I just uh, about hit the roof when I heard that. Yeah, 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 and well, it made headlines in the U.S. too. That the fact that he had said that uh, it's a very incendiary statement. One of the reasons he said, in my opinion, and he said, and now I'm allowed to have opinions because I'm not the director of the CDC anymore. Um, he essentially was fired when Trump was defeated. Um, he was Trump's director of the CDC. Um, I've met him one time. He's a smart man, but um, that doesn't mean he's he's right. Um, uh, and in this case, he said, in my opinion, I'm entitled to my opinion, it probably leaked from a laboratory by a lab accident. Why did he say, in my opinion? Because there is no evidence whatsoever. There is no evidence. People have been saying it could have leaked from a lab. Is it possible? Yes. Yes, it's possible. It's possible that, um, that a lightning strike would hit the um, very top of um, uh, you know, of the Empire State Building, it's probably much more likely that that would happen than, than that um, this virus leaked from a lab. Um, it's possible that a lot of things could happen, but is there any evidence that it happened? No. Is there evidence against that? Yes. Um, people have also been saying this virus is engineered um, by the Chinese Communist Party or maybe by the American CIA 
to cause misery and death. No, the scientists um, who study um, molecular virologists, some of the world's foremost molecular virologists have, have looked at this genome and have published on this and said, no, this is, this is not uh, a genome that has been engineered. It's got, um, it's got too many peculiar aspects in it. It's got too many things that are accidental, too many things that would be inefficient if you engineered it. It has not been engineered. It evolved in the wild. But then some people say, well, maybe it evolved in the wild and, and it leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They are accusing the woman that I talked about, Dr. Zheng Li Shi, the woman who has spent the last 17 years studying coronaviruses in bats and the last 15 years warning the world about coronaviruses in bats. They're saying, we think it might have leaked from her laboratory. Um, she has this virus that's 96% similar, but the virus that's 96% similar is not this virus. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that she had this virus in her laboratory and it leaked? Well, if she had this virus, why did she not publish that? She is in business discovering viruses and publishing them. If she had had this virus and she could see that it was dangerous to humans, that would have meant that she would probably um, have um, an article on the cover of the journal Nature, which would be wonderful for her career. She didn't do that. There was no sign that she had this virus. So again, um, Robert Redfield says he thinks that it came from that lab, but I've talked to, I've talked to some of the world's foremost molecular virologists, Eddie Holmes in Sydney, Australia, who's part of the Chinese team that sequenced this virus. Um, others, Andrew Rambo in Edinburgh and Christian Anderson in Seattle and, and others, the leading molecular virologists in the world. And they're all saying, no, no, this is a virus that came from the wild. Um, and um, is it possible to improve a negative? No, yeah. it's not possible to approve a negative. Therefore, perhaps we can never prove that it didn't leak from her laboratory. But is there any evidence? No. So the old Great, story thank of you, somebody, somebody saying in the, in the class, there is an invisible unicorn here beside me while I'm teaching you, but you can't see it. Well, yeah, sure. Go, go out and disprove that. Yeah. That's a, good, that's a better example than my Empire State Building example. <laughs> or oh, I copied it. It's not mine. That's actually, Telmo will probably remember. It's a standard started. example, exactly. It's a, a negative it, it, it goes back to some statement. some physicist, I believe, from the 60s, but it's not mine. I wish, but no. Now Luigi has a question, uh, please. Luigi. Okay, first, I apologize to the to the crowd, but as a, as a panelist, I cannot write the question in, in, the, in the list. So I took the liberty to ask directly a question. And my question relates to, to a couple of comments you made about the warning being there, the information being there, and, and, and the human perception of risk. Why are we so reluctant to acquire that information and transform that information in behavior? You know, as individuals, as politicians, as society. And, 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 and the second part of this question is that being your very transversal position. You talk to a lot of people, you explore different culture. Is there an heterogeneity in the perception of risk? In, and, and, and why is that we didn't come to the point of being more aware? Yeah, um, really interesting. And I want to talk about both those aspects. Thanks, Luigi. First of all, um, why did we not become more aware? Why were we not more prepared if Zheng Li Shi had been warning us for 15 years. And Peter Daszak, head of EcoHealth Alliance, has been warning us for 15 years. And others have been saying, watch out for viruses that emerge from wild animals. In particular, watch out for coronaviruses. And, and I was repeating those warnings in 2012 when I published Spillover. Um, why were we so unprepared? Um, I think it's because preparation is expensive for politicians. Uh, it can be very expensive. It can cost tens of billions of dollars to be prepared against a pandemic. And I don't, I don't imagine that the politicians didn't hear these warnings. Even Donald Trump, oh, there, I went and said his name. I swore that I was never gonna say his name again. Uh, even, uh, even this president that we had for four years, I can't remember his name. Um, even he had to be hearing these things. 
But why would he not spend money on preparations? Because if he spent tens of billions of dollars on preparations and then there was no pandemic before the next election, people would say, well, you wasted tens of billions of dollars because the pandemic didn't come. And science can say that it is coming, but they can't say when. But of course, um, we spend money on aircraft carriers that we don't use in wars, and we're glad that we have those aircraft carriers. And the costs of a pandemic are, well, this, I've seen an estimate that this pandemic um, is costing $12 trillion um, in terms of, uh, just in terms of economic losses around the world. So that's, that's a thousand times more than what pandemic prevention might have cost. Um, but politicians don't think about uh, that generally. They think about what's going to happen between now and the next election. So in terms of different kinds of risks and heterogeneity, yeah, that's, a, I think, a, a very interesting topic. And I've, I've thought about that for a long time, even outside of the context of pandemic. I believe that different people, because of the way they perceive themselves and identify themselves, the way they associate themselves with certain cultures or certain groups, they have differences in the flavor of risk that they are willing to tolerate. And it's not a matter of rationally gauging the size of the risk. It's a matter of the flavor of the risk. Um, there are people where I live in the Western United States who say, well, there's one chance in a thousand that a grizzly bear will come out of the forest and harm my cattle or my children. So we should get rid of grizzly bears because one chance in a thousand is too much risk. But that same person will drive his pickup truck down a country road at 70 miles an hour, not wearing a seatbelt, smoking a cigarette. That's more than one chance in a thousand in terms of the risk. But he embraces the flavors of those risks. Those risks are are things that he's willing to accept because they're in, in harmony with how he perceives himself. Whereas a grizzly bear, oh, that's just liberal conservation, green people who, who live in town. They don't, they don't live out here on the land. They're not part of my culture. So they want grizzly bears. They don't want cigarettes. They want seat belts. My preferred risks are different from theirs. Okay, thanks. Yes, I totally agree with you. It's, it's something related to psychology of risk and prevention. Now we have our colleague Massimo Zeviani, please. The floor is for you for a couple of questions. Please, Massimo. You can connect. Are you there, Massimo? We see there. your name. Oh, you're unmuting. There please. you are, Massimo. Hi. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, I am an avid uh, reader of your books, actually. Thank you very I much. I enjoyed very much your presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions concerning uh, bats and the fact that uh, you had mentioned the wet market uh, in China and uh, these wet mar markets uh, apparently have been banned by the uh, communist uh, government in China, etc. But uh, you also mentioned that uh, bats can uh, can transmit directly to to humans uh, because they live in caves and the people can uh, mm -hmm. can go to caves. They can breathe the same uh, air that uh, bats breathe and so on. So my first uh, very general question is whether you think that the wet markets are indeed responsible for this uh, pandemics or indeed uh, it is more likely that there is a direct uh, effect, a direct transmission from bats and uh, uh, to, to humans. And this uh, open uh, usher, ushers me to the second questions. So there has been a long standing debate about uh, the ability of uh, chiroptera and so bats in general to adapt uh, to different viruses uh, and therefore develop uh, a tolerance uh, 
terms of Im immunity. And I was wondering if there is any investigation uh, or recent investigation from this point of view, trying to understand uh, how bats can tolerate uh, this uh, uh, chronic uh, coronavirus uh, uh, establishment in their, in their colonies and whether this can be uh, useful for us to understand whether a similar adaptation uh, will be eventually uh, become a reality also for human beings. Uh, in, other, in other terms, whether we will be able to adapt to uh, and tolerate the presence of, uh, of this uh, particular coronavirus in our, in our uh, population. And this, uh, again, uh, is uh, directly linked uh, to the third and last question about the variants. Uh, uh, we are talking a lot in Italy and in Europe in general about uh, this uh, bloody variants, the British variant, the Brazilian variant, the South African variants uh, that seem to be more dangerous uh, and let the virus be more aggressive and more contagious. But do you think that uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, COVID-19 in particular, will be similar to influenza virus and therefore will require for us a periodic vaccination against uh, a mutant for which we will be uh, we will be uh, not protected from immunity or it's a different biology that can secure us after the first vaccination for a longer time. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Those are, those are three good questions, complicated questions. I could, I could actually do a half hour lecture just on your three questions rather than the four questions that, that I started with, but I'll, I'll try and give you um, good, concise answers. First of all, the variants, I'll take them in reverse order, your, your questions. First of all, the variants. Yes, we know that, that viruses always mutate when they replicate. It's very routine. They're constantly mutating. Um, the question is whether they mutate in ways that um, Darwinian selection um, causes to lead to adaptations. Um, and we have these variants, which are bouquets of mutations. They're clusters of mutations that uh, have been spreading, um, clustered together, you know, nine or 13 different mutations in one variant, and the variant seems to be successful. Some people say that um, that's because these variants are more transmissible. I talked with a very good virologist yesterday, and he told me it's important to remember, it doesn't necessarily mean they're more transmissible, it just means they're more successful, they're more fit in the sense of the survival of the fittest. Could be that they're more transmissible, could be that, yeah, could be other things. Yeah, right. But they are more successful. Um, can they can they adapt far enough to evade our vaccines? There is concern about that. Yes. Um, in some cases, there is already some evidence that, for instance, the Brazilian variant P1 might have already evolved so that it could reinfect people who had already survived one infection. So these this these variants are a sign that evolution is happening, Darwinian evolution is happening, and the more people who are infected, the more virus is replicating, the more it can evolve. Um, but we can adapt our vaccines. I understand from the vaccine scientists that it's, um, uh, it's entirely possible to tweak vaccines so that um, that next year's version of the coronavirus vaccine can be effective against this year's variants. Uh, we will probably need to keep vaccinating. Will we need to keep vaccinating every year with influenza? I'm sorry? Also because it has become very easy to create a vaccine variant thanks to, to, the, to the mechanism to produce vac new vaccines, right. RNA and DNA instead of proteins. Yes, so, so we can do that. Yeah, I'm optimistic about that. The question about bats and their immune system and why they carry so many viruses. I've mentioned bats as the, as the reservoir hosts, the hosts, the natural hosts of many of these viruses. 
bats do seem to carry more than their share of these viruses. That's partly because bats, the Choroptera, are a very, very diverse order. One in every, more than, more than one in every five species of mammal on planet Earth is a species of bat, 1400 species of bats. Great diversity, therefore, a, a, a great diversity of viruses, but also their immune systems are more forgiving of the presence of viruses. Um, their immune systems over evolutionary time seem to have, seem to have reduced their responsiveness to, to foreign, foreign material, including foreign DNA and RNA. And there's some very interesting work that's been done on that, suggesting that that is because of the fact that flight causes physiological stresses on their bodies that tends to release um, elements from their own cells that their immune systems would react to. DNA, uh, radical uh, unstable molecules from their own cells because of the stress of flight, they are the only truly flying mammal, that, that there are these suspicious uh, unstable molecules that are released. And if their immune systems were as sensitive as our immune systems, bats might be constantly in the state of autoimmune disease with their own immune systems attacking themselves. So they have evolved less responsive immune systems that allows um, them not to have autoimmune disease, but also allows viruses to live in them over long periods of time. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. And in terms of the question of whether bats directly pass this um, to humans um, in a market or elsewhere, I, I think the answer is that um, at this point, we just don't know. We need more data on that. We need more research and investigation. Thank you. Yes, I, I should say from an evolutionary perspective, David, that, that if we, we consider bats, they are evolving with pathogens, with viruses for 64 millions of years. Why we are mammals from Africa that, that we, 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 we came from Africa uh, 200,000 years ago. So that the diff completely different evolutionary histories. That's right. So yeah. thank you so much, David. Just a final brief point. Uh, can you give us some preview about your next book? at this point? <laughs> oh, well, a little bit. Um, I was working on one book for my book publisher, my American book publisher, Simon & Schuster, and also um, for my Italian um, book publisher, Adelphi. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful Adelphi. Um, but I was asked in March to do a book on COVID-19. I usually write books about things that other people are not writing books about. This is the opposite of that situation. There will be a lot of COVID-19 books. I'm trying to write, create one that will have unique value. I, I don't wanna say very much about how I'm proceeding, but I am talking to dozens and dozens and dozens of scientists, mostly by Zoom, God bless Zoom. And I am focusing on the virus, not the politics, not the medical crisis, the virus as, an, as a creature evolving in space and time and interacting with us, so. Um, Great. We're looking forward to, to, to reading this book. Thank you so much. Now I give Luigi the floor for the conclusion. Thank you. Let, let me say thank you, too, very quickly before Luigi closes. Thank you to Luigi. Thank you to you, Telmo. Thank you to all of you for welcoming me, but also for conducting this conversation in English. My Italian is no good. I want to improve it. When I get back to Italy, I will work on it. So grazie mille. Thank you for letting us talk in English. You were so kind. That's well, it. As, as I mentioned before in the in the small chat we had, you you have an open invitation to come to Padua and also to meet the students, to be part of our community for a couple of days. So there will be also an opportunity to practice your Italian. And also I'm, I'm, I'm glad because all the students had a, an interesting view of your trajectory as, as a writer and, and I suggest really to, to read any of your books, but also to look at how writing can, can affect science and can have an impact on society. So I think you are, you are a great example for all young kids and, and, and also colleagues in our faculty. So thank you very, very much for coming. We are looking forward to see you again here. And, and, and you know, it's just see you later is what we want to say. Thanks. 
And thanks Thank to you. everybody for, for spending this time with us. And I hope we, we did a little bit of what I promised at the beginning, to have the time to, to settle down and, and try to make a sense out of all of this. And, and you know, science is here for that. Okay, thanks again. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, Mike. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.